Retired Superior Court Judge Peter Velas recently released the results of a year-long investigation into sexual abuse allegations against the late Springfield Bishop Christopher Weldon. Velas found those accusations, quote, unequivocally credible. The report also criticized the Diocesan Review Board that heard the alleged victim's account in June 2018. Velas was asked by Bishop Mitchell Rosansky to conduct a thorough investigation into the allegations after Rosansky met with the alleged victim. Connecting Points Ray Herschel spoke with Judge Velas about his report and what his recommendations are for the diocese in better handling clergy abuse cases in the future. Well, it was an arduous task in terms of gathering all the evidence, but to specifically answer your question, it was a collection of evidence, a compilation of evidence from many different sources looking at documents, listening to narratives given to us, taking narratives and assessing narratives that the complainant gave to not only me, but to other sources, including the review board, and comparing for the purposes of consistency or any inconsistencies, uh, what was said in the content of those narratives. Because as you're probably aware, uh, it was more a circumstantial evidence situation than it was a direct evidence situation. The only direct witness, so to speak, was the complainant himself about allegations that occurred so many years ago. But with that, there had to be the only evidence remaining that needed to be examined was all of the circumstantial evidence of what I just mentioned, where he went, where he complained about uh, the content of his narrative, and, and giving his complaint. So all of that had to be juxtaposed. In other words, narrative given to one, narrative given to another. Not to speak of, which was critically important, the different pieces of that narrative that had to be displayed. For example, when he expressed the different locations where he was abused, and at the time allegedly abused as the investigation was unfolding, we visited the sites, Detective O'Connor, who assisted me in this investigation, without whom it would have been certainly a much more arduous task. That's retired Detective Sergeant Dennis O'Connor, uh, specifically was assigned to and fulfilled the obligation of going to different locations that are set forth in the report, Ray. So you'd get a better understanding of how it all got compiled. But to be more direct in terms of the answer, the compilation of evidence included his narratives, a juxtaposing of his narratives given to certain individuals, including myself, along with all of the things about that narrative, specific locations, specific objects that he recalled in an area where he was abused, specific people that he felt may have been there. And this led us down a trail of, as I say, a, a very arduous task in uncovering things that we tried to recreate that happened in the decade of the 60s. So circumstantial evidence, with the exception of him being the only precipient witness, and of course in the law, and it's set out in the report, circumstantial evidence can be given just as much weight as direct evidence. In this case, we had no choice. It's abundantly clear, however, that what plagued me and haunted me during this entire investigation was the fact that the bishop, did not have, Bishop Weldon, did not have the opportunity to refute the charges. Something we all have if we're accused of something. Being deceased, he couldn't do that. So the due process concept was of paramount importance to me. So that investigation was conducted in the light most favorable to him just because of that. And as a result of it, the standard of proof that was employed in terms of comparing the different standards that I decided I would use in evaluating the evidence, redound to the standard that's the most difficult for charges to be proved against them. But in this case, so there's no confusion. We didn't make a, I didn't make a determination and we in our investigation, were not focusing on was there guilt or non-guilt. We were focusing on strictly the credibility of the allegation. And thus, as you said, found it unequivocally credible. And you cited in your report the uh, consistencies uh, from the complainant as you uh, interviewed him and, and heard uh, his story. 
And uh, one of the things that uh, consistently came up were the numbers 52 and 56, as I understand it. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 52, for example, wasn't that address of the former St. Anne's Rectory in Chicopee where uh, this alleged abuse had taken place, according to the complainant? Correct. You obviously saw that in the report. 52 and 56 were, in your words, and as it's stated in the report, a consistent phenomenon that existed in this investigation. So we had to find 52 and 56. And this included, amongst other things, checking with registry of deeds, Chickabee Assessor's Office, an actual visit, uh, physical visit, first by Detective O'Connor, and then followed up by me, for the purposes of trying to corroborate, trying to find either consistencies or inconsistencies. Keep in mind, this was a recollection that this man had of events that occurred back in the 60s. You know what year we're in. The investigation, the inception of it, was about a year ago. So hopefully that answers your question. But a more clear answer, if I haven't been clear, and a more specific answer is set forth in this report. Judge Vilas, you were uh, somewhat critical of the Diocesan Review Board and the way it handled these allegations, which came to their attention uh, a couple of years ago. Can you elaborate a little as to uh, uh, why you feel the Diocesan Review Board did not handle this uh, uh, properly, as you indicated? I think that there was a reluctance to pursue further information in order to make a sound determination of whether or not those allegations were true. All of this emanated, of course, the investigation emanated from the fact that uh, the director of OSEVA, which is the acronym for the Office of, uh, of uh, Safety, uh, Safe Environment and Victim Assistance, Jeffrey Tran, who I like to call a phenom of sorts, in my view, based on this investigation and in my dialogue with him and in my experience with him, I saw an individual who manifested a fervor for a job and a mission that I've never seen before in all my walks of life in jurisprudence and in my other walks of life. So a lot of credit goes to him and to the diocese to have this man aboard now in addressing this problem firsthand. He propelled this investigation through Bishop Brzezanski, who insisted on it happening. And it's from that that everything evolved. Now, as to the review board, we were first pointed in the direction of that. The communications director gave us whatever information we needed. Matter of fact, everybody in the diocese was extremely cooperative in providing information. So let me make something abundantly clear to anyone who questions it. They were cooperative. There was no attempt to hide any evidence from us at all. The investigation revealed how they it was conducted, obviously, and it's from that that the review board based their determination. And frankly, we felt that it was woefully deficient and really not the prudent thing to do to make a determination of whether or not these allegations were true uh, on simply one report that they had available to them. And if you read the report, that particular phenomenon, to use that term again, uh, must be clarified in the sense that they only had one report when they made the determination. This is the same review board that said for the most part, they rely not between 95, I would say, conjecture-wise, but actually stating at least 90% of these decisions are made. Uh, they rely 90% on what the investigator says to them in the report. So the decision we discern from this investigation, that they erroneously went about this in the sense that they based their decision on, frankly, what was presented to them by the investigator. Now, I'm not trying to take away from the investigator in the sense that, that he didn't conduct an investigation. He did. But there were conflicts in terms of the product that he obtained throughout his pursuit that they needed to have the benefit of in the first instance. And I honestly feel that if they had the benefit of what I'll call two reports, again, parenthetically, more specifically set out in the report about these two reports, critical, critical piece of this investigation. Judge Vilas, uh, you were also tasked with not only determine, determining the credibility of the allegations, but also recommendations in going forward for the diocese. Uh, 
what are the major recommendations that you gave to the diocese to move forward in a positive way from your investigation? To sum it all up, Ray, to answer your question in three words, checks and balances. That is, in my view, agreed upon by, the, by Investigator O'Connor. It's, in my view, a model that should be adopted by them. So they're in a position where when they give a response to accusations of delay, deny, and cover up, their parishioners will be proud of why they gave the response that they did. And they'll be able to point to some tangible evidence about how they handle a problem, or handle a, an investigation the right way. So phase two is a critical, I don't mean to trivialize the phase one of the investigation, which is determine the credibility, lack of, or an inconclusion. Uh, but phase two is just of such critical importance because the deed has already happened. So it's how we're gonna deal with it in the future. And that's the critical thing. And I must say that, I must say that the task force that, that, the, that Director Tramp has assembled is headed by Judge Ford, a former colleague of mine, do an excellent job, I'm sure. And uh, we've had brief in two phases. One's already taken place, this task force, about those things you're mentioning. And the second phase takes place next week.